All right, so now uh, we're going to continue basically uh, looking at how we can solve such a problem. Uh, so once again, I mean, let me just quickly go over what I did. So essentially what we do is the following. Okay, let's get started, please. Um, so essentially, you know, first of all, we define the region uh, corresponding to each constraint one by one. And that's pretty easy to do. So, for example, we start with x1 plus x2 equals 7 first, and then that divides the plane into two. Uh, and then we, define, uh, we decide which uh, part we're going to pick, and that's, again, easy to do. Just pick a point on either side and, and plug it into the constraint and see if it's satisfied or not. If it's satisfied, then you're on the right side. If it's not satisfied, then it should be the other side. So, as a result, that's how we define that we should pick this side of this constraint, uh, this side of this line, this side of this line, this side of this line, and this side of this line. And now since we're interested in, in solutions that satisfy all of these constraints at the same time, we're taking the intersection of all these self spaces. Okay, so each constraint, you know, you can think of it as divides the plane into two. So good solutions, bad solutions in some sense. Okay, and then I'm taking the intersection of all good solutions. Okay, and by doing that, I obtain my feasible region. So basically for this problem, this will be my feasible region. So anything that lies in that shaded region will be a feasible solution. And remember, the feasible region is a collection of all feasible solutions, basically, right? Um, all right, so let me ask you a question. So why are we considering only two variables for now? What's the point of looking at two variable LPs for now? Well, because, because we can draw it and we can see what's going on, right? So, um, you know, if I had like one more variable, then this would be a three-dimensional object, basically, okay? And if I had four more uh, one more variable, then it would be a four-dimensional object, which is not too easy to see, okay, and draw either. So as a result, we start with only two variable LP problems, okay? Because it's something we can, we can draw, and at least we can see what's going on. So now I can, um, I can ask the problem in the following way. So I know that... Every point in this region, okay, will be a feasible solution, okay, for my problem. So my question is the following. Among all these solutions, among all solutions in this region, which one will give me the largest value for this function, okay? So essentially, among all solutions that lie in this region, in this feasible region, I'm looking for the best one. And what's the best one? The one that gives me the largest value of my objective function, okay? So... That's going to be our next step. So, so far, we at least know what our feasible solutions look like. And in the second phase, we're going to try to figure out the best feasible solution. Okay? Obviously, the best feasible solution should be in the feasible region. Right? So, so essentially, in this region, I'm going to try to find out the solution that will give me the largest value for this objective function. Okay? So let me ask you the following question. So can we achieve... an objective function value of zero using a feasible solution. So in other words, does there exist a feasible solution such that its objective function value will be equal to zero? Okay? So if you think of this as, as profit maximization, for instance, um, my question is basically, is there a solution that will give me a zero profit? Okay? The answer actually is yes. If I simply set x1 equals zero and x2 equals zero, then the objective function value, x1 plus 3x2, will be equal to zero, right? Okay? So at least I know that I can make zero profit. Okay? That doesn't sound very good, but, but it, at least I can do that. Okay? Now, what's the point of asking this question? Well, so here we have another equation, basically, right? x1 plus 3x2 is equal to zero. Okay? So what kind of an object does this define in my plane? So this defines a line, right? So this defines a line, basically. So let me go ahead and, and try to um, draw that line. So, so I know that my line goes through the origin. 
So this is going to be one of the intercepts. Okay. So what does this line look like? So I should figure out one more point, right, on my line. Okay, this is not too hard. So, for example, if x1, I, I can pick x1 to be 3, for instance. Okay, if x1 is equal to 3, then corresponding value of x2 will be minus 1, right? So as a result, it will have to go through these two points. Okay, and this will be the line that corresponds to x1 plus 3x2 equals 0. Does everybody see that? Okay. So essentially, to answer this question, I need to, I can look at this problem from the following angle as well. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and draw this line. So this is a set of all solutions that will give me a profit of zero, basically. Okay. And I'm going to ask myself whether this line intersects my feasible region. Okay. If this line intersects my feasible region, then that means that there is a feasible solution which has an objective function value of zero. Okay. So as a result, all I need to do is look at the intersection of this line with the feasible region and see if there's a point in the intersection. So in this case, as I said, the answer is yes. For example, 0, 0 both belongs to this line and also belongs to my feasible region. So which means that at least I can make a profit of 0. Okay? Um, so this line has a special name. So this is called an isoprofit line. What does isoprofit line mean? Well, so it means iso means same. Okay? So isoprofit line means this is the line of solutions which has the same profit, the same profit of zero. Okay? So anything on this line has a profit of zero, basically. Okay? So that's the reason why we call this isoprofit line. So now my question is the following. So can I improve this solution? Can I find a better feasible solution? Okay? So for example, let me ask you the following question. So can we achieve an objective function value of, let's say, 3? So for now, just you know, don't think about how I came up with 3, but this is just a question. So I know that I can achieve 0. So the question is, can I actually achieve a better value of 3? Well. Again, I'm just going to play the same game. So I'm going to look at the equation x1 plus 3x2 is equal to 3. Okay? So I'm going to try to draw this line. And I'm going to see whether this line intersects my feasible region. Okay? And if there's a point in this intersection, then that means that there's at least one feasible solution that gives me a value of 3. Does everybody see that? So now let me try to draw this line. So what does that line look like? Well, if x1 is equal to 0, x2 should be equal to 1, right? So this is the first intercept. And if x1 is equal to 0, x, sorry, if x2 is equal to 0, x1 should be equal to 3. So this is going to be the second intercept, right? Okay? So now my line has to go through these two points. So this is the line that corresponds to x1 plus 3x2 equals 3. Now back to my question. Can I achieve a profit of 3 using a feasible solution? Yes, I can, because anything that lies on this line segment will be feasible, right? Okay? So as a result, if I pick any feasible solution, such as this one, for instance, then I know that I can get a profit of 3. Okay? Now, this is a crucial observation, so I just want to make sure that you pay attention. So what can I say about these two lines? They're parallel to one another, basically, right? Okay. Now we started with this one, and we moved to this one, and now we have a better profit. Okay. And my goal is to increase the profit, to maximize the profit. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to try to push this line as much as I can, basically, right? And what's the best I can do? Well, the best I can do is this point right here, basically. Okay. So as a result, I know that by pushing this line in this direction, 
I'm actually increasing my profit, okay? And to, to obtain the best profit, the largest profits, I need to go as, as far as I can without leaving my feasible region, okay? And at this point, this will be the best solution, basically, for me, okay? So as a result, if I keep in, uh, pushing this line parallel, keeping parallel, basically, this will be the best solution, best feasible solution. How did I figure that out? Well, I just realized that, you know, by increasing my, by moving my line in this direction, keeping parallel to the first line, I'm actually increasing my profit. So here the profit was zero, then three, then six, then something else, and so on and so forth. And if I keep pushing this line, then the last point that I hit in my feasible region will be the best solution I have, okay? If I keep increasing this line, okay, if I keep moving this line, then the intersection of the line with the feasible region will be empty. Okay, which means that if I consider a higher profit, then no feasible solution will achieve that. Okay, so as a result, the best feasible solution will be the one which will be given by this one. Okay, this solution. Now, how do we obtain that more formally? Well, here's what we do. So let's consider the objective function. So my objective function is given by x1 plus 3x2 for this problem, of course, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a vector, which I'm going to call c, okay? And I'm going to define it in the following way. So I'm going to look at the coefficient of x1. What's the coefficient of x1? It's going to be 1. And then I'm going to look at the coefficient of x2. What's the coefficient? Three. So I'm going to call this my C vector, okay? Please pay attention to the order. So the first component is a coefficient of x1. The second component is a coefficient of x2, right? Now let me just go to my picture again. And what does that vector look like? So um, x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 3. So it basically looks like this vector right here. So this is my C vector. Okay, now, so here comes the calculus question basically. What's the relationship of this vector with respect to this line? So what's the relationship of this vector and this line? Perpendicular, right? So basically C is nothing but the normal vector basically, right, to my line. You remember that, right? You remember that? Yes, that's good, okay. So as a result, C is nothing but the normal vector to my isoprofit line, okay? Now, I just realized that by going from here to here, I actually increase my profit, okay? So I can say it in the following way. If I move in the direction of C, I'm actually getting better and better profits, okay? So essentially what I'm doing is the following. I'm taking my line and I'm moving in the direction of C basically, okay? And C is still perpendicular to this line. Okay, because I'm using the same equation for my line. Okay, the only change is the right hand side, right? The right hand side changes, but the right hand side has nothing to do with C. Okay, so as a result, essentially what I'm doing is by going along this direction, along the direction of C, I can increase my profit, and the last point I hit my feasible region will be the best solution I, I can get. Okay, so as a result, we're going to call C, so C is called the improving direction. And why is it called the improving direction? Well, it's pretty obvious, I guess, right? Because as you move along that direction, you get better and better profits, okay? So that tells you the direction to go if you want to increase your profit, basically, okay? And by simply moving my line along that direction, along the direction of C, I'm actually getting better and better profits. So as a result, since my goal is to get the, the best profit, I should go as, as much as I can without leaving my feasible region. And the best point will be this one right here, okay? So once again, if I go any further than that, then I will be leaving my feasible region, okay? So what does that mean? That means that, you know, higher profits will not be achievable by any feasible solution, okay? So I need to make sure that there's an intersection between that isoprofit line and my feasible region, okay? So the idea is pretty simple then, you know, just keep pushing that isoprofit line until you leave the feasible region, 
Okay? And the last point you leave the feasible region will be the best solution, the optimal solution for your problem. Okay? So how can I figure out what the solution is? So how can I figure out the coordinates of this point? Exactly. So it's given by the section of this line and this line, right? So I need to just solve an equation with two, two equations and two unknowns, okay? So the best point is given by the best feasible solution is given by so I'm going to write down those two equations. So the first one is x1 plus x2 equals 7 and the second one is minus 1 over 2x1 uh, plus x2 is equal to 4 and I will just solve them together, right, simultaneously. So what do you get by solving these two? So x1 becomes 2 and x2 is equal to 5, right? I'm not going to go over how you can solve this, right? So Multiply the second y by 2, add them up, and so on and so forth, okay? All right? So as a result, this is my best solution, best feasible solution, okay? What's the corresponding profit? Well, I'll just plug in these values into my objective function, right? So I'm going to have 3 times 2. Um, sorry, just 2. So I'm going to have 1 times 2. So 1 times x1 plus 3 times x2. x2 is equal to 5. So what's the total profits? So it's going to be 17, right? So as a result, you know, this is my optimal solution. And this will be my optimal value. So basically, I know that I can get a total profit of 17 by producing two uh, units of product 1 and five units of product 2. Okay? And that is the best I can do for this problem. Okay? So as a result, I mean, as I said, I mean, the procedure is pretty simple. So first of all, you define your feasible region. Okay? And secondly, you just draw your isoprofit line. Okay? And you figure out the improving direction. Then that direction tells you how you can improve your profit. So that's the direction in which your profit will increase. So basically, since you're, you're trying to maximize your profit, you should go as much as you can without leaving feasible region. And the last point is that you leave your feasible region will be the best solution. Okay? And that point is, in, this, in our example, given by 2, 5, so which is the coordinate of this point, which are the coordinates of this point, basically. Okay? So the largest profit you can have in this example is 17, and that's given by using x1 equals 2 and x2 equals 5. So just as an example, you can uh, see that if you plug in 2 and 5, all of these constraints are satisfied, right? If I pick 2 and 5 here, so I, have, I satisfy this with equality. This is with equality. 2 is strictly less than 4, so this is satisfied. 2 is non-negative, and 5 is non-negative as well. Okay? So all the constraints are satisfied, and as a result, the optimal solution is given by 2 and 5, and the optimal value is given by 17. Okay? Remember, the optimal value is obtained by plugging in the optimal solution in the objective function. Okay? Any questions? So, sure. Okay, so the question basically is the following. So, uh, my C vector does not go through this point. Okay? But that's not what I'm saying. So, I'm saying that C just tells you, gives you the direction to go. Okay? I mean, this point and the direction of C, well, whether C actually passes through this point or not, I don't care. Okay? All I do care is the following. So, this is my line, and this is the direction I should go. Okay? So, how much can I go in this direction without leaving my feasible region? And this is the best I can do. Okay? So, there's no relation between whether the vector C actually goes through this point or not. I don't care. Okay? All I want is, this is my improving direction. So, this is the direction I should go. Okay? So, I should keep uh, parallel to this line, and I should move along this direction, and the best I will do is this point right here. Okay? So, I'm not really uh, interested whether 
this vector actually goes through this point or not. So that's not my concern. Okay? So this is just my improving direction. So that's the direction that I can improve my objective function. Okay? Okay, but think of it this way. So, for example, look at this feasible solution. So, x1 is equal to 0 and x2 is equal to 4, right? Okay, what's the corresponding objective function value? 0 plus 3 times 4 is 12. And 12 is worse than 17. So, 17 is the best. Okay? So, of course, I mean, you know, you're getting uh, more profit from x2, but also producing x1 helps you as well. Okay, so that's what, what this means. X1 also contributes to your profit. Okay, so that's why you're actually producing more X2s than X1s in this problem. So you're producing five units of X2, whereas you're producing only two units of X1. Okay, of course that has something to do with, with the objective function. Let me ask you a different question. How does the problem change if I change my objective function? So for example, suppose that instead of having X1 plus three X2, I have x1 plus x2. So what does change? What changes in this problem? Let me repeat my question again. So suppose that I have the same constraints. The constraints are the same. Okay, so which means that the feasible region will be the same. My question is, what happens if I change the objective function to, let's say, x1 plus x2? Yes. Exactly. So, so I mean, this is this is important. Okay, just to see the relationship between the feasible region and the objective function. If I change my objective function, okay, then my isoprofit line will change. Okay, the slope of this line will change. Okay. So, for example, maybe it will be tilted in this way, or it may be tilted some other way. Okay. As a result of that, my c vector will change as well. Okay, the improving direction will change. And maybe going in this, uh, rather than going in this direction, I will try to go in this direction, and maybe this point will then be optimal. Okay? That's, 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 that's a different concern. So, but, but essentially, all I'm saying is that basically, you know, uh, if, your, if your objective function changes, then that means your isoprofit line and the improving direction also change. Okay? So remember, one thing that you should keep in mind is that the objective function has nothing to do on the feasible region. Okay? It does not define your feasible region. It just defines which feasible solution is the best one. Okay? So as a result, think of the objective function as a, as a measure in some sense. Okay? It measures the quality of your solution. Yes? If our objective function uh, is x1 plus x2, I mean, if the objective function slope is one of the constraints, mm -hmm. what would be the best solution? That's a good question. I'm going to talk about that. Okay? Is that clear? So is it clear what I said? Okay. So now let's look at a different problem then. So suppose that I'm going to look at the following problem. So the first one was a, was a maximization problem. So now I'm going to look at the minimization problem. So I'm going to minimize x1 plus 2x2 subject to 2x1 plus 7x2 is greater than or equal to 28. x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 9. And x1 is not negative and x2 is not negative. So unlike the first problem, now we have a minimization problem, right? So now I'm, I'm trying to minimize the objective function. And once again, I'm going to start exactly in the same way. So first of all, I'm going to try to figure out my feasible region. So for that, I'm going to draw, again, a graph. So this is my x1 and this is my x2. So the first step, as I said, is, is to figure out what the feasible region looks like. And to do that, I'm going to start with the first constraint. So what's the first step? First, think of it as an equality constraint, right? 
So what does this constraint look like? 2x1 plus 7x2 is equal to 28. So that defines a line. So if x1 is 0, x2 has to be 4. Okay? And if x2 is 0, x1 should be 14, right? So it has to go through these two points. So this is the line 2x1 plus 7x2 is equal to 28. So this is the boundary. It, it again divides my space into two, my plane into two. And now I need to figure out which, which side is the correct one. Well, once again, what you can do is you can, for example, try the origin. Okay? You can try 0, 0. If you plug in 0, 0, is this satisfied? So 0, 0 would not be the correct side, right? So I should pick the other side. So basically, that means that everything on or above this line. So this is my feasible. This is the region defined by the first constraint. What about the second one? So what does the second constraint look like? So I'm going to look at x1 plus x2 equals 9, right? So what does that look like? So it's going to go through these two points. So again, this divides my plane into two, into two spaces, half spaces. Uh, which one is the correct side? So once again, just plug in 0, 0. Okay. Does 0, 0 satisfy this constraint? No, it doesn't. So I should pick the other side. So as a result, I'm going to pick everything on or above this line. What else do we have? x1 non-negative, what does that mean? So everything should be on the right-hand side of the vertical axis. What about x2 non-negative? Everything should be above the vertical axis, uh, the horizontal axis, sorry. Okay. So, what does my feasible region look like? So basically, it includes everything in this region, right? Okay. So basically, this is my feasible region. So this shaded region, again, tells me the allowable values x1 and x2 can take. Okay? So once again, we're just looking at the intersection of all these four half spaces. And this is the intersection that we get. Um, what's the next step? Well, from this set of feasible solutions, I should pick the best one. So now how do I determine what's the best solution? I'm interested in one which actually makes this as small as possible now, right? Okay, so this is a minimization problem now. And once again, I'm going to start with the following question. So does there exist a feasible solution with an objective function value function value of, let's say, 20. Again, don't, don't worry about how I find 20 right now. Okay. Well, I'll just sort of play the same game, right? So I'm, I'm going to look at the equation divided by, well, which points have a profit of 20? So they should satisfy x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 20. Okay. 
and I'm going to go ahead and draw that line, okay, and see if this line actually intersects my feasible region, okay? So what does that line look like? If x1 is 0, x2 should be equal to 10, so it goes through this point right here. And if x, if x2 is 0, x1 is equal to 20, right? So 20 is somewhere over here. So as a result, it actually goes through these two points. So this is the line defined by x1 plus 2, x2 equals 20. Now, does that line intersect my feasible region? Yes, it does. So basically, anything that lies on this line segment will give me a profit of 20, right? Or will give me a cost of 20, more precisely. Now, for a maximization problem, we call this ISO profit line, okay? For a minimization problem, we call it an ISO cost line because we're minimizing costs. So as a result, um, this is my ISO cost line. And the idea is the same. So everything on this line has the same cost, basically. Okay, so in terms of my objective function, everything on this line is equal to one another. Okay, because they give me the same, same cost. All right, so now my goal is, unlike the previous problem, now I'm trying to decrease my objective function. Okay, so I'm trying to decrease my cost. So what kind of a change does that imply? Well, so once again, let's figure out our C vector. So what's my C vector for this problem? Well, I'll just look at the coefficients again. So the coefficient of x1 is 1, and the coefficient of x2 is 2, right? So again, my C vector, well, not again, but it's given by 1, 2 this time. And what was the relationship of this vector to this line? So it was just a normal vector. So as a result, this is my C vector, right? Okay, now I know from the previous discussion that if I go along this direction, then my function will increase, right? Okay, so as a result, if I want to increase my function, this is the direction I should go, okay? However, in this problem, I'm trying to decrease my function, okay? So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna go in the opposite direction, basically, right? So as a result, um, for a minimization problem, For a minimization problem, the improving direction is actually given by not c, but you actually have to negate it. So it's going to be minus c, and minus c is equal to minus 1 and minus 2. Okay? Now, what does the vector minus c look like? Well, it's just the opposite, basically, right? So. It's just a reflection of this. So as a result, this is going to be my minus C. And obviously, minus C is still perpendicular, right? But now it points in the other direction, OK? So now this is going to be my improving direction. And I'll just play the same game, OK? So what's the best I can do? Well, if this is my improving direction, I'm going to try to go along this direction as much as I can. And the best I can do is this point right here, OK? So as a result, this will be the best I can do. So this will be my optimal solution. What's the next step? Well, so how do I figure out the coordinates of the optimal solution? Again, it's given by the intersection of two lines. So the first one is 2x1 plus 7x2 is equal to 28. And the second one is that x1 plus x2 is equal to 9. So we just need to solve these equations simultaneously. OK? So I think x2 becomes 2 and x1 is 7, right? 14, 14, 28, yes. OK? So this will be my optimal solution. And what is the optimal value? Well, 
Well, I will just plug in the solution into the objective function. And if I do that, I'm going to have 1 times 7 plus 2 times 2. So 7 plus 4 is 11. So the optimal value in this case will be 11. Okay, so the smallest I can get, the smallest uh, cost I can get in this case for this problem is 11. So once again, if I want to move further, then I will be leaving the feasible region. Okay, so if I look at an even smaller cost, then that line will not have an intersection with the feasible region. Okay, as a result, um, as a result, the best I can do is this point right here, okay? So I cannot achieve smaller profits in my feasible region. Okay? Is that clear? So then what's the difference between maximization and minimization? Well, the only difference is in the improving direction, okay? So for a maximization problem, C itself is the improving direction, okay? That's the direction which increases your objective function. For a minimization problem, it's the negation of C, which is minus C basically, so minus C is the improving direction, that, that's the direction in which you decrease the objective function, okay? So for a maximization problem, obviously you're trying to increase it, and for a minimization problem, you're trying to decrease it, so that's why we negate it by uh, multiply mi minus one. So this is important, okay? So just make sure that uh, you understand this well, so any questions? Okay, so before I move on, we have seen two examples so far, okay? And both examples have some common properties, basically. So, and my question is basically, what are the common properties that we have seen so far? Because this is in, important in terms of understanding the problem, yes. Okay, so one common uh, property is the following. So in both examples, there was one point which achieved the best value, right? Best object function value, okay? What else? And that point was always on the intersection of two lines, right? So that was like a corner point in some sense. What else? There are two variables, okay. The other one had three constraints basically, right? Well, we can have an equality constraint, but uh, if you look at the regions, there are also some common uh, properties, right, between the feasible regions. So, for example, if I go back to this problem, just look at the sides of the, the boundaries of the feasible regions. So, you know, this one actually is like linear. This one is linear, this one is linear, and so on and so forth, right? So the boundaries are straight, basically, right? And if I go to this example, of course, I mean, here, the feasible region is not bounded, it actually, it's unbounded, but if I look at the sort of boundaries of my feasible region, again, this is a straight line, this one is a straight line, this one is a straight line, and so is this one, okay? So this is one property that makes an LP problem very special in some sense, okay? The feasible regions always have this property, okay? The boundaries are always sort of straight lines, okay? Sorry? <coughs> So, so as a result, and in both examples, it turns out that there was a corner point which was given by the intersection of two lines which was optimal, okay? So the reason I'm telling you this is because this is important and this property also generalizes to actually higher dimensional uh, problems as well, okay? Now in three dimensions, for instance, rather than having uh, sort of two axes, you're gonna have three axes, right? So there's gonna be x1, x2, and x3, okay? And in three dimensions, again, the objective function, sorry, the feasible region, will have similar properties, okay? What kind of properties? So uh, each side of the feasible region, again, will be linear, okay? So the boundary of the feasible region, so it's gonna be like basically, um, I mean, think of this as, for example, you know, this will be the boundary of the upper boundary, the lower boundary, and so on and so forth, okay? And again, there will be certain corner points, okay? So as a result, rather than having a two-dimensional picture, you're gonna have a three-dimensional picture now, okay? And of course, if you even go to higher dimensional uh, problems, then it's not easy to visualize what's going on, but again, there are similar properties as well, okay? So this kind of properties actually extend to problems with, with a, a larger number of variables as well, okay? Um, all right, so what are we going to do next? Well, we're gonna look at a few more examples, okay? Just to sort of uh, figure out what kind of other sort of situations can arise. 
Um, in particular, so uh, one of you already sort of noticed that, in both of these examples, there was a single point which was optimal, right? So there was only one optimal solution. However, it's not too hard to see that, you know, that should not necessarily be the case, okay? Because if I simply take my ISO cost line, for instance, right? And if I tilt it a little bit, such as this one, just to make sure that the, this line and this constraint are, are parallel to one another, okay? Then the best I can do is basically everything in this region, right? So in that case, there will be more than one optimal solution, okay? So as a result, there are some situations in which there's not only a single optimal solution, but there's a whole bunch of them, okay? So we will look at uh, an example on Thursday. What are the other situations? So for example, um, again, if you look at this example, suppose that instead of minimizing this function, I'm trying to maximize this function, okay? So I'm just replacing min by max and everything else is the same. So what's the problem with that? Well, I can increase this function as much as I can, basically, right? Okay. So in that case, we will say that the problem is unbounded. So there's no optimal value, okay? Or the optimal value is plus infinity in some sense, okay? So there's nothing that sort of tells me or that prevents me from increasing my objective function. So such problems will be unbounded. And there's one final case. Uh, the constraints may also be inconsistent, right, in some cases. For example, uh, there may be no value of x1 and x2 that satisfy all of the constraints at the same time, okay? So then we, uh, such situations may also arise, and we're going to look at such examples as well. You had a question? Uh, so in actual problems, there can be only two types of sources. I mean, one is cross-cross the problem, and the other one is Uh, yes, in two dimensions, yes, okay? In, in higher dimensions, it's going to be actually more complicated than that. But essentially, uh, so just, just give me a minute, okay? So, um, now there's one thing that's, that's important from these two examples, as I said. Like in both of these examples, there was a corner point which was optimal, okay? So what do I mean by a corner point? So what I mean is basically it's given by the intersection of two lines. Can I have your attention, please, for a second? Okay. Um, so in both of these two examples, there was a corner point which was optimal, right? And I gave you another example. Well, at least I sort of mentioned another example in which you can tilt this objective function a little bit, okay, so that it's parallel to this line. Then everything on this line segment will be optimal as well, okay? However, even in this situation, there will be still two corner points that are optimal as well, okay? So, as a result, now despite the fact that there are infinitely many feasible solutions in my problem, okay? For example, everything in that region is a feasible solution, right? <laughs> this will tell us that there are actually special feasible points which can be optimal, okay? And those special points precisely are the corner points, okay? And the advantage of looking at corner points is the following. So if I go back to this example, for example, here you have again an infinite number of feasible solutions, okay? However, there's only one, two, three, four, five corner points, okay? So from now on, uh, when we look at, you know, LP problems with, with a uh, larger number of variables, we're going to say that, you know, corner points are special and it suffices only to look at those points, those feasible solutions, okay? And the advantage of looking at only corner points is that, you know, there's only a finite number of them, okay? So as a result, if you can sort of figure out all the corner points and if you look at the, the objective functions, you can tell which one is the best solution, okay? And that's going to be exactly the idea behind the algorithm that we're going to discuss later on, okay? So that's the reason why we start with two dimensions, but from now on we're going to look at more general problems as well, okay? So I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>